All right, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good to be back with you. Miss you saints during the week when we don't get all be together and often think about what a joyous time it had to be there in the in the first century, especially like right after the resurrection around that time and they're meeting daily together and just being able to be together and oh, how joyous. One day soon. One day soon we'll get to be together all the time. <clears throat> all right, today. Jumping back in, I'll get a taste of it in a few weeks, yeah, for the feast. Um, jumping back into the series on understanding the Bible. Uh, today we are getting into the uh, fifth and final book of Moses. Um, it's the, we'll be wrapping up what's known as the Torah or the law portion. Uh, remember, there's a three-part divide of the Hebrew scriptures, the law, uh, the prophets, and the writing. That's like, you ever hear about the Tanakh? It's just an acronym, T-N-N-K, the Torah, which is the law, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings. Um, <clears throat> so we're wrapping up the law portion today. Deuteronomy, uh, in Hebrew, this book is called Devarim. If you recall, I told you basically um, they would take the scrolls and kind of look at the first word, you know, so Bereshit in the beginning. Uh, Exodus is Shemot. Um, these are our names. And so this one is Devarim, words. Uh, these are the words. I have here for our key verse, uh, Deuteronomy 6. Four to five, often called, often called the Shema, because uh, that's the word for listen, uh, to hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And this is, uh, and I have this more in here for the uh, verse five of this here, that God wants us to love him with every ounce of our being. Uh, it's the same thing he sought when he... Uh, chose a people through faithful Abraham and said, I'm going to bring your descendants and I'm going to bless them and I'm going to make them a multitude and I'm going to bring them out and I'm going to bring them into a land. I'm going to set them apart as a people and I want them to be holy. I want them to be like me and I want them to love like I love. And so he wants his people to love him with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. Um, integral part. Uh, I'd say another big part of Deuteronomy, um, not so much a key verse, but there's be several verses along this line. I set before your life and death. Choose. Blessings and cursings are throughout the book. And he keeps reminding them of this. Um, coming through Torah, as I said, today we're in the fifth and final book. In Genesis, um, it brought us from creation through the death of Joseph. And in there, we went through um, creation of man and, and all else and how the first man and first woman failed. They fell short of the glory of God. They sinned because they lusted in their heart after something. And death came to all because all have sinned. But God in his mercy and grace and patience and love towards his creation, who's made in his own image, said, I am going to bring a way of salvation. I am, and I'm going to bring one who will be the ultimate sacrifice and bridge you back to me. Mankind, again, falls. And we see the wickedness spread across the earth to the point that God says, I'm going to wipe out most of these people with a flood. And he saved Noah and his family, eight people. And the various animals of the world saved upon the ark. And he entered into a covenant with Noah after uh, the flood dissipated. And he said, with you and your children and all the peoples of the earth. So that's all of us, because every one of us are descendants of uh, Noah and Mrs. Noah. And says that he's entered the covenant with us. And uh, set that forth as to how that is, you know, like what... Uh, having capital punishment, you know, these type of things set into play. Uh, and again, man went aside, 
after his own heart, in his own defiance, building a tower of Babel and, and other things occurring uh, there. But God calls one man out of Ur, out of Babylon, and sets apart Abraham, sets apart Abram, and later calls him Abraham, enters into covenant with him, and says, through you I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. And being that we know the end of that, we know that that blessing uh, that Abraham brought was not the physical nation of Israel, but one particular Israelite, one particular Jew who was born 2,000 years ago, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has brought the blessing of God to all peoples, who will grab a hold of his skirt, who will take hold in faith that he is God's ultimate sacrifice. He is the covenant for the people, the mediator of a greater covenant, uh, a greater sacrifice uh, than that of Abel or any man, a greater priesthood than that of Aaron, uh, a greater prophet than that of Moses. Um, and so we see so much of this stuff laid out here in the book of Genesis. Moses, as Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you believe me because Moses wrote of me. And I'm hoping this is what we're seeing in here as we're going through this overview here of the Torah that we're not getting caught up in minutia of this and that law that were applicable to a people. Again, not all peoples, but applicable to a people of a nation of Israel and those who had joined themselves unto Israel. And we get lost in that minutia and miss the larger picture, the greater picture. All right. So we see the formation of this nation of, of Israel beginning with, the, with Joseph and his brothers and coming down to Egypt. And uh, they then, as they be, start to become multiplied and become a nation within this nation, they're enslaved. And God sent a deliverer to bring them out by the blood of the Lamb. And he brought them out to encamp at Sinai. And that encapsulates Exodus. From there, uh, while at Sinai there for a year, they learned about holiness. God was telling these people, here's what I want for you to be separate and to be different and to be an image of me to the world. In uh, Numbers uh, from the encampment at Sinai, he says, okay, we've been here. I've taught you about holiness. I've set you apart. I've given you these laws. Come walk with me. Let's go get that land I promised you. But the people again failed in their unbelief, in their untrusting of God to deliver unto him, unto them what they, he promised. They turned and therefore were forced to wander in the wilderness for the next 38 years. Uh, until after the 40 years of wandering, they were to be brought in. They said that because of your unbelief, you're all going to die. Your children I'll bring in, but because you didn't believe me, you're not going to get it. And so um, we end up there in numbers at the plains of Moab. And uh, they're just outside there waiting. We saw even Moses himself failed as he struck the rock and was told, you can't enter in. So Deuteronomy uh, is right here in the same time frame. Uh, they're at the plains of Moab. And uh, Moses spends much time rehearsing their history and uh, what's going on and uh, essentially gives them three sermons uh, about what's happening. We see in Deuteronomy uh, 1, one to three, these be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel, in Laban and Hezerot, and these these Ahab. And then he says these are eleven days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Imagine how short their journey would have been. It's eleven days' journey. It took them forty years. Why? Unbelief. All right. And it came to pass in the 40th year, 
in the eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. So, as I'm saying, they're here, they're, they were cursed to walk 40 years in the wilderness. And here in the 40th year, in the 11th month, first day of the month, Moses begins this sermon series. All right. And then we know that this uh, took place uh, within under 40 day period because. Uh, we find in the next book, in Joshua 4.19, the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. And so that would be 70 days from the time Moses began his sermons until they're entering the Promised Land. But we also know the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. So that last month, <laughs> basically the 40th year, they were there weeping for Moses. At some point between the 11th and 12th month, they're weeping for Moses for 30 days. Um, and then the first month of the following year, they enter in on the 10th day and they cross the Jordan. Okay, So this get a little bit of a time aspect. Basically, that are at the end of the 40 years, about to enter in, and Moses is now saying, hey, I want you guys to look at this. I want you to know what happens. And, and there's a reason for this, too, because as we just went over, the children of Israel, who were there to see everything that happened in Egypt, to see all the miracles, to see the things that occurred, for the most part, they're dead. Aaron's not there. Miriam's not there. All their generation's dead. Joshua and Caleb are left. Everyone else was 20 or under. So there'd be some who might have some sight of what God did. Now, granted, even the young ones would still have the evidence of God still meeting with Moses, still doing things right there up until this time. God still provided manna all the way through the 15th of the first month when they enter in. So evidence of God still all around them. But he's rehearsing this history and saying, I want you to, to learn. I want you to understand. I want, I want you to understand, you children, why you've been here in the wilderness this whole time. Deuteronomy review, uh, reviews the Torah, and it foreshadows the rest of, of the Old Testament story. It really does. There's, and, and again, if um, we get eyes to see the picture as we do through the New Testament, as I often have said, the New Testament is God's exegesis of the Old Testament. And the pictures there are just so vivid and, and real to make this really be uh, clear and understood. So in Deuteronomy, we find that Moses reminds the people of God's actions in the past. He reminds them of, of uh, God's promises to Abraham, found in Genesis. He reminds them of the faithfulness in rescuing Israel in Exodus, of, of his holiness, as we see in Leviticus, and of his punishment under disobedience, as we see in the book of Numbers. This is all here in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's there in those books, but yes, it's all encapsulated here. He's saying, I'm going to remind you of all these things. God has been faithful to his promise. Even though you have been unfaithful, he has been faithful and is still bringing you in. Don't think that you're in because you're holy in comparison to your, your fathers, that you did this of your own arm. And he'll go in in, like, uh, I think it's chapter 11, he goes in to say, this ain't the case. You're not getting in here because you're something. You're getting in here because of the faith of Abraham and the promise of God that he made, and he's faithful to it. Also said he also Moses also for forewarns and uh, foretells what's going to happen with the children of Israel. He gives directions, blessings, and warnings. He speaks of the appointment of Joshua as the new leader. He speaks of God's expectations of kings, which will take effect when Saul becomes king in 1 Samuel. We see that there. Hey, you're going to look around you and see other nations have kings. You're going to want that. Here's what to do to regulate that. That king has to write himself a copy of the law. You know, he goes through these things about what's going to happen with that. They said there's prosperity for obeying God. And we see this during David and Solomon's reigns. That there'll be exile for disobedience which happens when the tribes are conquered by Assyria and by Babylon. 
he puts them out of the house and back into captivity. And then God's promise to restore Israel, which happens when Cyrus allows the Jews to return from Babylon and Ezra. And others are also caught out. But again, if we have eyes to see the greater picture of what's going on with this, uh, of as we'll get into a prophet like unto Moses and the greater work and the greater uh, restoration, it's all here. So, as I said, Deuteronomy, for the most part, consists of three speeches or three sermons of Moses. Okay? Um, so, chapters 1 through 444 is his first speech. That re he's going to recount the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, which led to that very moment when he's there talking to them, and ends with his exhortation to observe the law. His second speech picks up uh, there and carries on basically to chapter 29. Um, I'll break that down a little bit more as we come into it. Uh, he reminds the Israelites of the need to follow God and the laws that he's given them on which their possession of the land depends. He's saying, you need to follow what God says. You need to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and being. You know, that's right there in chapter 6. You need to come in and do what he says. And don't be like the people he put out. Remember, he put them out for doing what they did. You come in, you follow him, or you yourself will be cast out. You yourself will be broken off. And then uh, in 29 uh, through 30, we get his third speech where he is offering comfort that even should the nation of Israel prove unfaithful and lose their land, that with repentance, all can be restored. Uh, and then from, from there, we, we gets into the song of Moses and uh, blessings and uh, the appointment of Joshua and the death of Moses. All right, so coming a little bit more here of an of a outline. Um, Chapter 1 through 443, as I said, is Moses' first speech. Like I said, he's going to recount everything that happened in the wilderness, how they failed, why they're there. Uh, his second speech begins in 444. And in this case, a little bit more of a breakdown. The second speech kind of 1132, because uh, in 12, he starts picking up what's known as the Deuteron Deuteronomic Code. It's, a, it's essentially, it's a... Um, uh, a bunch of the laws, some of which are repeated from Exodus, Leviticus, some of a little bit more uh, sketched out that haven't been sketched out before. Uh, there's correlation. It's based a, a lot off the 10 and how they, they play out in minutia mode. Um, and then in 27 to 28 there, it's uh, the blessings and curse chapters, uh, basically some admonition from uh, leadership. Um, 29 to 30, I said, is Moses' third speech. And then 31 to 34 is Moses' last days. Right. <clears throat> so his first speech, uh, we have uh, the introduction. And then uh, 6 to 8, we have, he reminds him of God's words at Horeb and what occurred. He uh, explains how God had appointed judges to assist him, to assist Moses, because he was saying, look, I, I got to complain to God about you guys. You guys were just too much to bear because you guys are so stubborn, stiff-necked, and I'm believing it's God appointed judges to assist because of the great weight that you people are. Uh, and then he says uh, how he brought them there to explore Canaan, and their unbelief caused them to disobey. And so in chapter 2, he says, you know, the wilderness wanderings, we could have gone in, but we didn't uh, because of your unbelief and therefore your disobedience. Uh, and he comes in and talks about the conquest of the land east of the Jordan, uh, which a couple of the tribes asked, hey, can we have this land over here? All right, but you got to continue fighting with us. Come over the Jordan, fight this. You can go back and have this land. All right. Um, Chapter 3, he recounts there how Moses must hand it over to Joshua, hand over the reins, the leadership. Um, 
And then in chapter uh, 4, we're, we're seeing how God's saying, this is the way, walk in it. Follow it. Here's the path. Here's what he has planned. Here's what's going on. And then we see in, uh, at, at the end of 4 there, the cities of refuge are appointed. And uh, we hear about that later again in the book of Joshua, where he sees he, he appointed six cities of refuge to show that everything that God promised to Abraham regarding the land that they received in full. It's not an unfulfilled promise. It's not something that's waiting for a millennium. It says these things were done. Here today, we have six cities of refuge, which he said he would, he gave us three. He said he would give us the rest if he gave us all the land, and he did. All right. <clears throat> so in Moses' second speech, um, we have his introduction there in uh, the end of chapter 4. Chapter 5, this is the other area where we find the Ten Commandments reiterated because uh, first we first read of them in Exodus 20 when they're first given at Sinai before the whole golden calf incident. So now Moses is reiterating the Ten Commandments to them, uh, saying these are the words of the covenant. He talks about the response of the people. Chapter 6, like I said, I got into the heart of it there with verses uh, 4 and 5 about loving, trusting, and obeying God because the concept of hearing God, of, you know, of Shammai in God is not just hearing it like you're listening to the music. It's hearing him, trusting him, and obeying him. All right. Uh, chapter 7, he picks up in verses 1 and 2 saying, hey, take over the land. But he also then tells them right away, he said, here, I'm going to read it in there. He goes, when the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you go to possess it, you've cast out the nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, even nation, seven nations that are greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them, utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them, show no mercy to them. So he says, Take over the land. Come in there. Put these people out. God is, at this point, using Israel as a rod to spank these other nations, as he later uses other nations to spank disobedient Israel, Assyria, and Babylon, to name. But he says, take over the land. But then he starts going in here to the rest of chapter 7. Don't take over its customs. Come in. Take the land. Don't do what the people there did. Notice they were put out. What did it cost them? It will cost you the same thing. Don't do it. As I said, um, much of Deuteronomy is based on matters of blessings and cursings, life and death and what's going to occur. And so here in chapter 8, uh, he expounds more on that in like 1 and 10, how obedience um, will lead to their blessing, and their disobedience will lead to disaster. And he reminds them here in chapter 8 again about how faithful God and, and God's great providence to them. He says, you should remember, like uh, verse 2 here, you should remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you and to know what was in your heart or you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and suffered you to hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you didn't know, nor did your fathers, that he might make you to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. And your clothes didn't wax old upon you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. And so he's reminded them, God provided you for this. Even in your disobedience, God provided, even as your punishment, God provided for you. But he did this also to humble you. So you recognize you're not self-sufficient. He, you know, he ain't having you come here to be an off-grid, off-grid from God people. He wants you to be leaning on the everlasting arms. He wants you to know that he is your provider, that he is your judge, that he is your king. He is your maker. He is your husband. He is your father. And he wants you to honor him and love him such. And so he warns them not to be thinking that they're something and not thinking that they did these things for themselves. 
but that God is the one who's provided it. He warns them that their disobedience will lead to the disaster. In uh, chapter 9, he continues to say, you don't deserve the land. I, I missed the why there and they. They don't deserve the land. Because he's just like us. We don't deserve the land. We haven't earned the promised land. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about we haven't earned eternal life. We haven't, there's nothing that we have done to deserve it. What every one of us deserves is, is the same thing that they deserved, and that's death. Every one of us. Why? Because there's none good, no, not one. Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us sinned, and sin has reigned from Adam through Moses and on forward because every one of us has sinned. And that's why we need our Savior. Because that Savior will come in, into people's lives and remove their shoulder from the burden, remove the taskmaster of sin, create a new heart wherein God's law could be written, which will direct the way for our feet to walk because we can only walk what our heart really is oriented towards. If you wonder why you or your children or your spouse struggling with sin is the orientation of the heart. It's always been the heart of the problem, the problem of the heart. So he continues to say, look, you don't deserve the land. Israel is a sinful people. And this is stated throughout Deuteronomy 9. In chapter 10, he, um, he picks up talking about the covenant again. He's, uh, he says, how at that time, there's verse 1, the Lord said to me, Hew you two tables of stone like to the first and come up to me in the mountain. I will make you an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So he made the ark. What's it called? The Ark of the Covenant, right? Because it holds the two tablets. These ten words, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote these things and, and gave them to him. And he um, said how he was going to be working with this, how he was going to be doing these things with the people. What would happen with the tribes? What would happen with Levi? How would he have no inheritance? And Levi would be uh, the people. And he says, uh, verse 12, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. So, Again, the heart of the book of Deuteronomy is, again, it's about the heart. He wants his people to love him and serve him. And it's love that comes before service. It ain't this, come out and serve me. Come out and just do these laws. Because without love, it is not going to happen. It's not going to happen in a real sense. Sure, you can have someone, a checklist. People do it all the time with their jobs people don't like to do their jobs, but they do it because they want a paycheck. But their heart's not in it. God said, this is the same way. I don't want you to deserve, I didn't hire you. I want you to love me. And when you love me, you will do it. That, my people get that wrong in the, in the Messianic and Hebrew roots movement. Well, they'll use Jesus' words, of, well, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And, and they're kind of putting the cart before the horse. You're missing the whole point. He's saying, if you love me, this is what you will naturally do. Not, if you love me, then do this. Then show it, prove it. No. When you love me, you will naturally do what honors me. Same way with when a, when a husband loves a wife or a wife loves her husband or parents love their child or child loves their parents, they will naturally do what honors the other. So he speaks about how he had to renew the covenant with the people. And chapter 11, once again, he comes back to talking about blessings or cursings. 
What's your choice? Here's what's going to happen. You shall love the Lord your God, keep his charge, his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments always. 11, 1. This is, this is throughout Deuteronomy, over and over. You can like record this and put it on repeat because it's throughout the text. Moses just keep telling this is this is what you're called to. This is what you're called to, O Israel. And if you and if you come, and if you do listen diligently to my commandments, here's what I'm gonna bless. I'm gonna bless the land, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna, and if you don't, here's what I'm gonna do. Life and death is set before you. All right. Now here, I just wanted to highlight some text in here. Um, trying to keep this a little briefer today since we're going to be delving into some homework as well. Um, what we see here, uh, as I stated, we come back to Genesis, we see there's a couple of different covenants occurring in there. We see specifically a covenant with Noah, which is made with all people, a covenant made with Abraham, which is made for Abraham and his family. So it's not all people, it's just them. And then eventually we come into Exodus and we find there's a covenant made not with all of Abraham's children, but specifically with the nation of Israel. It isn't made with Keturah's people. It wasn't you know, made with other people from Abraham. It isn't made with Ishmael. It's made with Jacob's offspring. And not even made with Jacob, as we'll see here momentarily. Okay. Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 8. He says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, this is Moses saying this, that you should do so in a land where you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. We shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, for what nation is there so great that has God so near unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great which has statutes and judgments and so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Oh, well, Babylon and in Ethiopia. And, no. These are rhetorical questions. The answer is nobody. Nobody has this law that was given under Israel. And I bring this up because, again, people get this concept, I am the Lord, I change not, and think that all this law was given to all people from Adam forward, and it's not the case. This was a covenant specifically cut with the people of Israel and anyone who joined themselves to them. This is according to the Torah, Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 5 says, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us. So this covenant cut at Horeb, this Torah of Moses, is not the Torah of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This isn't the same covenant that was cut with them. This is a different covenant, he says. And I include two witnesses here from the Torah itself, but the rest of the scripture speaks to this. And I just include one example from the book of Romans, uh, Romans 2, 12 to 14. For as many have sinned without the law also shall perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law shall judge by, be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are, the, are just before God, but the doers of the law should be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, those things contain the law, these not having not the law are a law unto themselves. Do the Gentiles have the law? No, the Gentiles didn't have the law. It's the same thing Deuteronomy 4 told us. What nation is there that has this law? None. The Gentiles don't have it. This was a covenant, a marital agreement between God and one nation. Not God and all nations. It isn't God committing polygamy. It's God and one nation, and this is the marital agreement between God and that nation. Now, <clears throat> by the way, in here, here's several verses that talk about this covenant and what this covenant is. Deuteronomy 4.13, he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments. He wrote them upon two tables of stone. As I remember, I told you these two stones were placed in the Ark of what? Ark of the Covenant. Why is it called the Ark of the Covenant? Because it holds the two stones. Why? Because the two stones are the covenant that God made with the house of Israel. All right. Deuteronomy 9, 9 to 11. 
when I got up in the mount to receive the tables of the stone, even the tables of the covenant, which the Lord made with you. But I abode in the mount 40 days and 40 nights, neither to eat bread or drink water. The Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. On them was written all, according to all the words which the Lord spoke unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of assembly. And it came to pass that in the 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And then this is the same thing recorded back. Uh, two witnesses out of the book of Exodus. He gave unto Moses, which he had made, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, and that be the same words of covenant, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Exodus 34, 28. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did eat neither bread uh, or drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, which are the Ten Commandments. Okay. So just for clarity, this is... This was the agreement between God and the nation of Israel. This is not an agreement he made with Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. It's not an agreement he made with, with Noah. It wasn't an agreement he made with Adam. This is an agreement between him and the nation of Israel and anyone who joined themselves unto them, including any of the mixed multitude who came up with them uh, who weren't toast or swallowed or whatever else, um, or people uh, through later history who joined themselves unto them. Uh, they were subject unto this covenant. Okay. Um, Jeremy 4, verses 20 to 30, says, uh, The Lord has taken you and brought you forth out of this iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swore that I should not go over the Jordan uh, and that I should not go into that good land, which the Lord has given you for an inheritance. I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan. But you shall go over and possess that good land. So take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and you make a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. When you shall beget children, and your children's children, and you have remained long in the land, and you shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, you evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land where unto you go over the Jordan to possess it. And you shall not prolong your days upon it, but you shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. You shall be left few in number among the heathen where the Lord shall lead you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood, stone, which neither see nor hear, nor eat, nor smell, but if from there that you shall leap, seek the Lord your God, you shall find him, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when you are in tribulation, all these things come upon you, even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient to his voice. All right? So here we're seeing Moses, before they even enter the land, he says, you're going to come in there, in the time to come, you're going to become idolaters. He's already seen it. From the, from the, from the, they haven't even gotten out of their marriage bed yet, and they're already worshiping a golden calf, already committing spiritual adultery. They just said, I do, and they should have said, with who? Because they weren't faithful to God. Right? And so here he's telling them, and this is interesting, is, is these things in here, if you're familiar with the text, because these things that he's saying right here are things that are the specific things we're going to read later in the blessings and cursings. Here in the cursings, what happens when, when you fall short of God, you're going to be left few in number. You're going to be scattered among the nations. You're going to serve God. It's the work of men's hands. You're going to be doing these. These things are told are right there. Let me get to the blessings and cursings later um, at the end of Deuteronomy. But Moses foretold him what the issue is. And here again is the issue. God says, here's the problem. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always, and I might be well with them and their children forever. Right? Here's the issue again. Here's, here's the answer. The answer is the heart. If there was a heart in them that would have them fear God and keep his commandments. If they, the heart was in them that they would love God, but their heart was hardened. They were stiff-necked. The issue's the heart. Yes, the issue's the heart. And, and 
I want to say back on that last frame there too. Notice she says, you're going to come in and then you're going to have children and your children's children. We need to be telling our children about how deceitful sin is and how much things in this world, whether they be physical or just theirs, how many things glitter and attempt to catch your eye and turn your heart away from him. Not all idols are visible. Some of them are invisible idols of the heart. And if people turn and lust after these things and st instead of looking to God as their constant provider, their loving father and spouse, it's so, so easy for us to slide away. Because that's what an unrepentant, what an unregenerate uh, heart will do. So after chapter 11, we come into the lat a latter portion here of, of uh, Moses speaking, but it's going over uh, the Deuteronomic Code, essentially, where he's going to go in, talk about different aspects of the covenant in what's for them to do and not do. Uh, so in chapter 12, uh, we come into uh, various instructions uh, for worship and how things are to be, including the place of worship. That there's one place. So this place you're coming to, these people worshiped under every high hill, under every tree. You don't do those things. You come. He wants a unity in his body. I mean, there's one place to worship God. Now, for us, it's not that we come to a temple made with hands. We have one place for our worship in God, and that's the body of Christ. All right. <clears throat> chapter 13, uh, he talks about uh, false prophets and false teachers. There arise amongst you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams who gives you a sign or a wonder. And even if those signs or wonders happen, you know, but they turn you away from God and say, do this or do that. Don't follow after them. You know, a lot of times we can say, we can prove a false prophet by the prophecy doesn't come true. Or we can prove someone's a false miracle worker if it doesn't come true. Even if someone works a miracle, but they're saying, hey, go do this or go do that. And this go do this or go do that is against the word of God. Don't listen to such a person. And under the theocracy of Israel, they were to put such a person to death. Now, I'm not saying we're to be doing that here. That that'll be God's place to place such people to death. But it is our place to not hearken unto the false prophet or the false teacher. They are to be dead unto us. As the voice of sin and temptation should be dead unto us. Right. Chapter 14, uh, he comes into uh, mainly the, the food laws, uh, you know, clean and unclean again, just like he had in Leviticus 11, uh, in matters about ties and how things operate like that. Uh, there's some other... I mean, it begins with, you know, don't cut yourself, but then it goes into things that are abominable, things that are not, things that you can eat, things that you can't eat, things that you sh can't eat, but you can sell to the alien within your gates or give to the stranger here because you are holy. Holiness is a separation. We're to be separate from that. Those people can do that. You cannot. All right. Um, chapter 15. He uh, talks about the uh, year of release in the seventh year. Uh, with creditors uh, not exacting, uh, uh, not exacting of his neighbor, of his brother, because it's called the Lord's release. These things that occur in the uh, releasing of slaves goes into matters of Hebrew slaves and all that. Uh, chapter uh, 15, the latter portion there, uh, 19 through 23. It talks about how the firstborn male animals are gods. They belong to God. Again, a lot of these things aren't going to pertain to us physically in the sense that we are not Israelites living under this covenant. This covenant is was a temporary covenant between God and the nation of Israel, beginning 430 years after the promise to Abraham until the time, until the ear uh, 
the one who was to bless all nations was to appear. The time of the, the, the fruition of the promise in Christ. All right. Um, so it talks in the matters here about the firstborn males. Um, and then in chapter 16, he uh, delves into the matters of the feast. Uh, and, you know, three times to all your males come up in a pair. Uh, he talks about, you know, so unleavened bread, talks about uh, Pentecost, Shavuot, uh, and then talks about uh, Sukkot or uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, um, as some may call it. And the rules for all that, how that all works. Um, you know, some, some other odds and ends in there starts talking about, um, before the end of the chapter, talking about judges and officers, which he I have there more in 17, but it actually picks up in 16. Um, rules for judges and kings and how to appoint judges for every uh, city. Because remember, there's trouble when everyone was trying to come to Moses. And that's when Moses was like, Man, these people are too much to bear. You know, what's going on? Did, did I give birth to them? They're, they're your people, God. You, you Help me out here. And so he says, set up judges in every city so people can come for uh, wisdom and, and uh, that uh, they can remain love. Uh, in the community uh, for one another and that people can have their interpersonal problems uh, dealt with or their questions about uh, the matters of the laws and uh, all that can come before them. Um, so it hits on the different aspects of there. In uh, chapter 18, it goes into uh, rules uh, regarding the, the Levites um, in the first eight verses uh, and what's happening with them, uh, how they have no part in inheritance. Uh, they're going to eat the offerings uh, and other aspects there regarding the Levites. Um, chapter uh, chapter 18, verse 9 uh, through 22 picks up rules about prophecy and what happens with uh, different types of prophets, including necromancers and wizards and all that. We'll, we'll look at that text in a moment. Uh, chapter 19 uh, deals with, um, what well, starts a bit with the uh, cities of refuge. So this is about what to do with killers. In the case of someone, there's been accidental death and they can have the city of refuge. Um, other aspects regarding that. Um, and then, uh, that's why you get into the laws of two or three witnesses. That's about matter of capital cases. Um, and then in chapter 20, uh, there's uh, rules about conduct of war. Uh, how people should be with that, how that should operate. Chapter 21 uh, through 25 is uh, laws about life in the land, and it's going to be a, a, you know various civil laws, laws for rulers, laws uh, of uh, worship, various aspects within uh, these chapters here. Chapter 26 is uh, regarding uh, matters of gifts for God and um, how that happens with, you know, taking the first fruits unto God and, and uh, all that type of matter, uh, matters of tithes and what all that is. Um, and the aspect of uh, the matters of prophecy in chapter 18, uh, it says here in verse 9 to 14, when you're coming to the land which the Lord your God giveth you. So a lot of these verses, you know, I have this, I had this section labeled as laws of living in the land because a whole bunch of these are when you come into the land. When you come into the land, and this is what it's regarding how it's gonna, how you're gonna live once you cross the Jordan. What's what's gonna be uh, essentially what's the constitution for Israel? Here's here's what's gonna be. How's, here's how your land's set up to to be. Here's how you're gonna live there. When you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. You shall there shall not be found among you anyone that makes a son or daughter to pass through the fire to use his divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of familiar spirits, a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, Lord your God has driven, uh, does drive them out from before you. But you should be perfect with the Lord your God for these nations, which you shall possess, um, hearken unto observers of times, and uh, unto diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God does not allow you to do so. He says, I'm going to bring you in there. Don't do as people did, because what they did turned their hearts from me, and as a result, they're being spewed out. Now, unless you want to follow in their footsteps, don't follow in their footsteps. 
You know, if you're at the ultimate end of what their footsteps went to, do it. If you don't, if you want life, if you want blessing, don't do what they did. He says all those, all those prophets and all that stuff is going to lead to your destruction. However, let me tell you about another prophet. The Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you. Like a, uh, he's a, it'll come of your brethren. Like unto me, Moses says. Unto him shall you listen. According to all that you have desired of the Lord your God and Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire anymore, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass, whoever shall not listen unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I'm going to require it of that people. All right? So now, some will claim, well, this is a prophecy of Joshua, the son of Nun. We'll come back to this. All right? Because yes, Joshua was to follow. But is it that Joshua, son of Nun? Chapter 27 and through 28 here, um, this is the blessings and cursings chapter. Chapters. A little bit in there, 28, a little bit in 29. He says, um, he begins in 27, tell them to remember the covenant. That you come in, uh, I'm, I'll read here the first few verses. Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, all the commandments which I command you this day, you, you keep them. It, will, it shall be on the day when you pass over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God gives you that you shall set up great stones and plaster them with plaster and you shall write upon them all the words of this law when you have passed over that you may go into the land which the Lord your God has given you, a land that floats with milk and honey as the Lord God of, my, of your fathers has promised you. And it shall be when you've gone over the Jordan, you set up these stones which I command you this day in Mount Ebal, and shall plaster them with plaster. And there shall you build an altar unto the Lord uh, your God, an altar of stones. Don't lift any iron tool upon it, and build an altar unto the Lord of God, whole stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings thereon upon the Lord your God. Peace offerings you shall eat there. Rejoice the Lord your God, and write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. So here we see the, he's reminding them of the covenant, that there's Moses and the elders with him, telling the people, do this. Come there, build an altar on Mount Abel, Ebal, take these stones, and you write all the words of the law here as you come in to the land. <clears throat> and so from here, uh, from 11 on down, he, uh, he had, because then he had charged the people that same day, he says, you go stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over the Jordan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin, and then these stand upon Ebal to curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And then the Levites shall speak into all the men of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Cursed is the man that makes an eager, and it's cursed and cursed, and it's pronouncing these things of curses. And in chapter 28, then, the blessings for those who disobey and those who obey. Through chapter, uh, through verse 14 of chapter 28. But on the rest of 28, it talks about the results of turning from God. What's going to happen when you disobey? Moses already said, this is what's going to happen. I know you're going to come in there because you don't have a heart to obey God and you're going to fall. You're going to turn and worship stocks and stones and do these things and he's going to spew you out. Oh, this is the verses that is right under uh, the start of Deuteronomy 27. I forgot I made a frame for that one. In uh, 28, uh, pick it up here, just verses 61 to 67. This to get a pretty good synopsis of some of the cursing. He says, every sickness, every plague, which is not written in the book of law, then will the Lord bring upon you until you be destroyed. 
and you should be left few in number, whereas you were the stars of heaven for multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoice over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to nothing. And you should be plucked off from the land where you go and to possess it, and the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall you find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest. But the Lord shall give you there a trembling heart, the failing of eyes, sorrow of mind, and your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you shall fear day and night and shall have none insurance of your life. And in the morning you will say, what to God it was evening. And in the evening you say, what to God it were morning. And for the fear of your heart where you shall fare, and for the sight of your eyes which you shall see. Moses is foretelling them what's going to happen. And that's, as I said here at the start, this book of Deuteronomy sets up for the rest of the story of the Old Testament of what's occurring. Israel does exactly what Moses says. They fail as they're part of the covenant. And God, over and over, in patience and long sufferings and mercy, continues to try to, uh, continues to prop them up and to have mercy and grace. Not, not again, not for their sake, not because of the righteousness or righteousness of this person, but to continue to fulfill his promise that has been made not only to Abraham, but back to the beginning to Adam and Eve that this promise that there would be of a seed who will redeem all of creation, all of mankind made in his image. And that had to come through Abraham and through his line, through Isaac and through Jacob. And he had to bear patiently with these people, even if they were people who were fit for destruction, so that he could have mercy on the vessels made for mercy as Paul spells out so eloquently in the book of Romans. Deuteronomy 29 through 30 uh, picks up Moses' third speech. And so in the uh, first half of 29, picks up with Moses saying, you have seen what God has done. And he's telling them, he says, uh, verse 29, 1, he says, These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Moses called to all unto Israel and said unto them, You have seen all the Lord had done before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto the Pharaoh, to all his servants, unto all his land, the great temptations which your eyes have seen and the signs and those great miracles. Yet the Lord has not given any of you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxed old upon you. Your shoe is not waxed up old upon your foot. You have not eaten bread or have drunk wine or strong drink that you might know that I am the Lord your God. And so he keeps reiterating these. Learn. Learn from the past. Learn from the mistakes of your forefathers. Learn from your own mistakes. Learn that God will never fail you. You will see, you have seen what God has done. And from here he goes on to say, you will see what God will do. In the latter half of chapter 29. Chapter 30, uh, verses 1 to 10. He goes in here about, um, Chapter, I'll pick it up in verse 1. When it comes to pass, when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, you shall call to them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. He's saying, look, this is going to happen. You're going to have times when, when you have prosperity, where God blesses you as a nation, and they're going to have some really hard times, and you're going to be driven out among these nations. And it come to pass when that happens. And you shall return to the Lord your God and shall obey his voice, verse 2, According to all that I command you this day, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will turn your captivity and have compassion on you and will turn you and gather you from all nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. 
Yes. Yes. Um, if any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord your God gather you, and from thence will he fetch you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your father possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will do you good and multiply you above your fathers. And the Lord your God shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. What was God speaking of here? Is this something that's yet to occur? Say, so this is already, this has already happened. The people had their blessings, the people had their curse, the people were dispersed. And in their dispersion, there was a righteous remnant that cried out to God. And God heard their cry, and God had mercy, and, and didn't only bring the righteous remnant back to the land, he brought, he brought others. He said, not all who are Israel are of Israel. And though many were there physically in the land, they were broken off branches, waiting to be burned up, that have no life in them. But God granted life unto the remnant, the faithful remnant, and he sent a prophet like unto Moses unto them. Paul says here of Deuteronomy, the verses we just read there, 11 to 14, in Romans 10, Romans 9, 10, and 11, as I've gone over in times past, great story of what God has done. It's a great overview of his story, of what he's doing with the people and what this new covenant is and the redemption, and these things have occurred and are occurring. This is not stuff of the millennium box. God has fulfilled his promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. There in the days of Joshua, there in the days of Nehemiah, and most assuredly in the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man who does these things shall live by him, but the righteousness which is of faith, he speaks on this wise, saying, don't say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up again from the dead, but what does it say? That the word is nigh, even in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. And with the heart, man believes on the righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Paul here is quoting from Deuteronomy 30. This is the commandment I command you this day. It is not hidden from you. It's not far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who's going to go to heaven and bring it down to us? And we can hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea. That you should say, who's going to go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near unto you into your... It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. So much of these things of, of Moses, Moses surely wrote of Jesus Christ, as, as Christ said, he wrote of me. Again, the greatest Bible study ever in Luke 24, the two on the road to Emmaus. Christ is replete throughout there. Deuteronomy points so much to Christ in the new covenant and what's going on with remnant Israel and Jew and Gentile one and Messiah. We saw earlier that the issue, even after he gave the 10 and he says these people are Oh, that there was a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. But yet, through Moses, he prophesies there's going to come a time. They're going to come a time to do exactly what I told you is going to happen. They're going to fall away. They're going to be idolaters. They're going to do all this wickedness, and I'm going to put them out. I'm going to curse them. I'm going to have them in fear of their lives. I'm going to have them be few in number. I'm going to take away their blessing. They're going to be put out of the house. And one day, when they're sitting there and they're humbling, there will be those of them who drop to their knees and put their face to the ground and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
in those I will hear in their repentance and I will draw them near to me and I will rescue them from their captivity. I will send fishers of men and fish them and bring them back unto me and they will be mine and I will give them a heart of flesh wherein I can write my law and I will make a new covenant with them wherein my law is in their hearts and they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Do you not realize Torah points to this greater story? Deuteronomy 31, 34 gives us Moses' last days. We see that Joshua will be the new leader. Uh, and then arrangements are made for the takeover. We get Moses' farewell song, known as the Song of Moses. And then uh, final blessing. And Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses. Now, we know uh, as we started this series, went over the authorship of the different books. Moses is the author of the Torah, of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, when I state that, that doesn't mean that every word within the book was written by the hand of Moses. Um, there's things that are stated here, especially here at the latter end of Deuteronomy, that were assuredly not written by Moses, including his death, his burial by the Lord, and then what occurs thereafter. Because we can see uh, at, a, at a later statement, since that time, and there's often time markers like that, like that in the Scripture that someone has done an addendum. And from that time, there has not been. From that time, we can see there's things written at a later time, okay? It does not take away from the book or does not make that part unholy. It's still all by the hand of God, whether it was just the hand of Moses or another hand that God had in there with it, right? Deuteronomy 34, 5 to 12 says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beit Peor. And no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. So here's an example, unto this day. This wasn't written the day Moses was buried. This is written sometime later. Right? And Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eye had not dim. His natural force had not abated. So he was still full of life, still full of vitality. His eyesight wasn't gone. He was still full of life, and it had not been for his sin. He would have been able to this more so than take a look, but enter in. The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plain of Moab 30 days, and so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended, and Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit and wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet. Here. Let me highlight this here. Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit and the wisdom, and Moses laid his hand upon him, and children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay? So remember the prophecy. Was this Joshua? Oh, but it says Moses laid hands on him and he was he was the one and, and the people listened to him. It says you to listen to that prophet. Oh, but look what's next. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. Alas, it is not Joshua. It's the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. Not that Joshua. Right? Whom the Lord knew face to face in all signs and wonders, which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, to all his servants, to all his land, and all that mighty hand, and all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Remember, we went over in the last piece about when Miriam and Aaron, who are you, Moses? You know, they're they're doing like uh like Dathan or like Korah. Who are you, Moses? Hey, is there anyone like Moses who I spoke to face to face? You may prophesy, but I come to you in a dream. I come to you in a vision. I talk to him face to face. You sure you want to be bad mouthed at Moses? There's no one like him, he's saying. 
Well, that again, here is the prophecy. Deuteronomy 18. And we did find fulfillment of that in a Joshua, who is a son of noon. His noon means per perpetuity or eternity. Our Yeshua, our Jesus, the Son of the Eternal, is the prophet like unto Moses. John 6, 14, these men, when they had seen the miracles that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. They had questioned it with, in the time of John. Are you, are you the Messiah? Are you that prophet? Not fully understanding that Messiah and the prophet are one. Luke, in the book of Acts, records of Peter. He says, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins might be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, that prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. There's been all these prophets, but none of them were the prophet like unto Moses until Christ came into the world, Christ Jesus. Him shall you hear, and all things that he says unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear of that prophet shall be destroyed amongst the people. Wasn't that Jesus' own testimony as he walked there amongst the teachers of Israel? You think you're going to have life in Moses? You don't. Hear my words if you want life. There's no life in Moses. Yeah. If you read what Moses testified of Christ and you grab a hold of Christ, yes, there's life. You want to hear Moses, hear what Moses testified. says, Yea, all the prophets from Samuel that arose thereafter, as many as have spoken, likewise foretold of these days, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and, the, and in your seed shall all the kingdoms of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God has raised up his son Jesus and sent him to bless you and turn every one of you from his iniquities. So again, Peter starts to find Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him. He's blessing you first, Israel, because he came unto his own. And even as his own did not receive him, the faithful remnant have grabbed a hold of him. The faithful remnant, faithful Israel, have loved him and served him and known and grabbed onto him. No one is the arm of the Lord who has been outstretched to rescue us and to redeem us from slavery to sin. To make us one people again under one king one nation, Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. The Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet from the midst of you, your brothers, like me. Moses says, to him shall you listen. In Luke 9, it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tents. Remember, here in the vision, let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, and while he said these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud, and the voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Same thing said of the prophet. Listen unto him, and whoever doesn't listen unto him, you have an answer to God. Life and death is listen to that prophet or don't listen to that prophet. Life and death is set before you, blessing and cursing. That prophet, like unto Moses, Moses was a prophet. He interacted with God face to face. He was a deliverer of the people who came to deliver them from bondage. He led them in the Exodus. He mediated a covenant between God and them. Psalm says he was a priest. He was, after all, a Levite. And he was a ruler. A prophet like unto Moses would be all these things, and in a greater sense than Moses. And our Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest of prophets.
He interacted with God face to face, morning by morning, getting up, speaking with God. He even came from the heavens. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the Greek, there is pros, means face to face. He was face to face with God from the beginning and has always interacted with him. And he came as our deliverer. He came to deliver us from bondage to sin and to lead Israel out, that faithful remnant and all those, the mixed multitude who would come out of the world with them. He has invited us, all of us, to journey with him to exodus from sin. I've preached in times past about the greater exodus because the scriptures preach of the greater exodus, especially throughout the prophet Jeremiah, talking of these things that would occur. These, this has been prophesied from the beginning here. It's here in Torah. That God's at one time, when you guys are lost and, and shackled by your own sin, and you cry out, God's going to pull you from all the places he scattered you, and not only you, but all nations who are called by my name. And I'm going to make you one people. I'm going to put one king over you. A righteous branch who I'm going to raise up unto David. Hallelujah. What glorious, glorious, righteous justice and mercy and grace from our Lord Jesus Christ and our God our Father to deliver such a prophet unto us, such a Savior. And not only did he lead in the Exodus, he mediated a covenant, a new covenant with the people of God, with the house of Israel the, and the house of Judah and with all nations, the mixed multitude who have joined themselves unto him. Christ Jesus has made a new covenant. And it's not like that covenant that was made with the fathers which they forsook. Jeremiah 31. Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. It's not that covenant, but it's a new covenant. And it's a covenant in which everyone is a believer. Everyone knows God from their heart, from the new heart he's given them, created a clean heart within us in his new spirit that guides us in a way so that we can have a heart that would love the Lord our God and fear him and serve him always. And Christ is our priest, our greater priesthood than that ever of Levi or Aaron. And he is the ruler. Deuteronomy, also much like the other books of Moses before it, show us that God alone is God. People may go and worship stars and planets and trees and stocks and stones and declare them to be their gods, but there is no God but him and him alone. These other things are all created, whether they be physical or whether they be spiritual, whether they, they be the host of heaven, and not just the physical bodies, but angelic beings. They're not gods. There is but one God. And he alone is our provider, our maker, our husband, our covenant maker, and God provides over and over. God provides, ultimately, Jesus Christ, the prophet like unto Moses, the lamb that was, blood was shed to redeem them from, from slavery, to redeem us from slavery. He provides the manna. He provides our clothes, our shelter. He provides the air we breathe. He provides Everything. God is a God of our vision. God is grieved by sin. Hence, the people had to walk 40 years because their hearts would not be after him and fall and die in the wilderness. Their carcasses left there. God judges and punishes, but God is merciful and gracious and it will have mercy upon the repentant remnant. And God is faithful to his promise. He endured with these people who are a people fit for destruction, so that he may have mercy upon us. Vessels of mercy. Right. I am just 
awed by the story and what what he shares for us with us here in the word his miraculous ways his provision for us through Jesus Christ to include us all in this in this story and to include us in life though not a one of us deserve it much like we saw with Israel they didn't deserve to be brought in the land we don't deserve to be brought in the land God's mercy is so abundant his grace is so amazing if I can use that term don't let us take it for granted don't let us don't let us be like Israel of old the unfaithful Israel who oh yeah I got a savior oh yeah he brought me out yes I'm free from having to do this or that oh but he tells me to do this that but I really don't want to do that I want to do this or that on my own now that I'm free from that and don't do it love him serve him with all your heart with all your mind with all your strength with all your being all right that's it for me today uh, be faithful choose life <laughs>